He's coming. He's coming. Good afternoon, everyone, and apologies for, for this delay. We are just waiting for Dr. Mike Ryan to join us. Uh, and then uh, we will start our press briefing on COVID-19. Uh, while we wait for Dr. Ryan, uh, just let you know that uh, we are planning to, uh, from now on, have three co press conferences per week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So that would be a little change from what we had so far. But obviously, we have to remain flexible. This can change again. But for the time being, we are looking into Monday, Wednesday, and Friday more or less the same time from here. And I will give a floor immediately to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Tariq, and hope you had a very good weekend. I'd like to say good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with a brief update on the Ebola epidemic in DRC. As you know, we have uh, two fronts. Uh, it's now three weeks since the last case was reported and a week since the last survival, survivor left the treatment center. We are now in the countdown to end of the, the outbreak. We continue to investigate alerts and vaccinate contacts every day. And the security situation in northern Kivu remains fragile. In previous Ebola outbreaks, we have seen flare-ups even after the end of the outbreak. So we're continuing to provide follow-up care for more than 1,100 survivors and keeping teams on the ground to respond quickly to flare-ups if needed. The outbreak may be ending, but our determination is not, and nor is our commitment to combating the COVID-19 epidemic. As you know, over the weekend, we crossed 100,000 reported cases of COVID-19 in 100 cases. It's certainly troubling that so many people and countries have been affected so quickly. Now that the virus has a foothold in so many countries, the threat of a pandemic has become very real. But it would be the first pandemic in history that could be controlled. The bottom line is we're not at the mercy of the virus. The great advantage we have is that the decisions we all make as governments, businesses, communities, families, and individuals can influence the trajectory of this ep epidemic. We need to remember that with decisive early action, we can slow down the virus and prevent infections. Among those who are infected, most will recover. Of the 80,000 reported cases in China, more than 70% have recovered and have been discharged. It's also important to remember that looking only at the total number of reported cases and the total number of countries doesn't tell the full story, except the potential the virus has. Of all the cases reported globally so far, 93% are from just four countries. This is an even epidemic at the global level. Different countries are in different scenarios, requiring a tailored response. It's not about containment or mitigation. 
which is a false dichotomy. It is about both, both containment and mitigation. All countries must take a comprehensive, blended strategy for controlling their epidemics and pushing this deadly, deadly virus back. Countries that continue finding and testing cases and tracing their contacts not only protect their own people, they can also affect what happens in other countries and globally. WHO has consolidated our guidance for countries in four ca categories, those with no cases, those with sporadic cases, those with clusters, and those with community transmission. For all countries, the aim is the same. Stop transmission and prevent the spread of the virus. For the first three categories, countries must focus on finding, testing, treating, and isolating individual cases and following their contacts. In areas with community spread, testing every suspected case and tracing their contacts becomes more challenging. Action must be taken to prevent transmission at the community level to reduce the epidemic to manageable clusters. Depending on their context, countries with community transmission could consider closing schools, canceling mass gatherings, and other measures to reduce exposure. The fundamental elements of the response are the same for all countries. Emergency response mechanisms, risk communications and public engagement, case finding and contact tracing, public health measures such as hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, and social distancing, laboratory testing, treating patients and hospital readiness, infection prevention and control, and an all of society, all of government approach. There are many examples of countries demonstrating that these measures work. China, Italy, Japan, the Republic of Korea, the United States of America, and many others have activated emergency measures. Singapore is a good example of an all of government approach. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, regular videos are helping to explain the risks and reassure people. The Republic of Korea have increased efforts to identify all cases and contacts, including drive-through temperature testing to widen the net, the net and catch cases that might otherwise be missed. Nigeria, Senegal, and Ethiopia have strengthened surveillance and diagnostic capacity to find, to find cases, cases quickly. Further details on specific actions countries should take in specific contexts are available on WHO's website. WHO is continuing to support countries in all four scenarios. We have shipped supplies of personal protective equipment to 57 countries. We're preparing to ship to a further 28, and we have shipped lab supplies to 120 countries. We're also working with our colleagues across the UN system to support countries to develop their preparedness and response plans according to the eight pillars. And we have set up a partner's plot platform to match country needs with contributions from donors. As you know, 
more funds are being made available for the response and we're very grateful to all countries and partners who have contributed. Just since Friday, Azerbaijan, China, the Republic of Korea, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have announced contributions. Almost 300 million US dollars has now been pledged to WHO strategic preparedness and response plan. We're encouraged by these signs of global solidarity, and we continue to call on all countries to take early and aggressive action to protect their people and save lives. For the moment, only a handful of countries have signs of sustained community transmission. Most countries still have sporadic cases or defined clusters. We must all take heart from that. As long as that's the case, those countries have the opportunity to break the chains of transmission, prevent community transmission, and reduce the burden on their health systems. Of the four countries with the most cases, China is bringing its epidemic under control and there is now a decline in new cases being reported from the Republic of Korea. Both these countries demonstrate that it's never too late to turn, to turn back the tide on the virus. The rule of the game is never give up. I'll repeat that. The rule of the game is never give up. We're encouraged that Italy is taking aggressive measures to contain the, its epidemic. And we hope that those measures prove effective in the coming days. Let's hope the antinode the antinode to fear. Let, I will repeat this, let hope be the antidote to fear. Let solidarity be the antidote to blame. Let our shared humanity be the antidote to our shared threat. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, so we will... Um start uh, with questions. I will uh, repeat that uh, those who are dialing through mobile phones should uh, type uh, star 9 and those who are watching us online should click uh, raise hand uh, and we will stress one more time that uh, it would be good to have only one question per person uh, and we will start as always with a couple of questions from the room and then we will go uh, to our to journalists watching us online. Um, Shoko, please can you start? Thank you, Tariq, for taking my question. Uh, Dr. Tedros, you just mentioned that the threat of a pandemic has become very real. But um, when, you say pan when you say pandemic, what, what, according to what criteria you say pandemic? Because I understand there is no um, criteria for the new novel coronavirus. Thank you. Um, um, the... Um you're right, there is no uh, <clears throat> accepted definition of uh, pandemic of coronavirus or uh, pandemics of, 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 of any things, uh, really. I think the, the principle underlying uh, a pandemic is a principle that in some senses the disease has reached a point where its further spread from country to country uh, cannot be controlled. In other words, that there's a, I said in the press conference here a number of weeks ago, if this was influenza, we would have called a pandemic ages ago because we know something inherently about the transmission dynamics of influenza. So it's not an avoidance of the word, but it, the word is important because in many situations, the word involves uh, countries moving purely to a mitigation approach. And what we've seen is that moving to a purely mitigation approach is essentially saying the disease will spread uncontrolled, in an uncontrolled fashion. But we've seen other countries, like Singapore, like China, demonstrate real um, success in turning the disease around. So this 
controllability versus being controlled or uncontrolled. Uh, so uh, from our perspective, and as the Director General has said, we're reaching that point, and when you reach 100 countries, um, and when you reach 100,000 cases, it is time to step back and think. Uh, two, or th two weeks ago, there was 30 or 40 countries. So now it's 100 countries. And that's not a quantitative measure, but it is a qualitative measure of what direction we're going in. And that's what the Director General is saying. We're very close because at that point, many more countries may become involved. And at that point, the virus will be everywhere. Uh, the contradiction to that is, unlike flu, we can still push this back. We can still significantly slow down this virus. So the word for us is not a problem. The issue is what the reaction to the word will be. Will the reaction to the word be, let's fight, let's push, let's push this disease back? Or will the reaction to the word be, let's give up? Uh, and it's, it's, for me, I'm not worried about the word. I'm more concerned about what the world's reaction will be to that word. Will we use it as a call to action? Will we use it to fight? Or will we use that word to give up? And I think that's what the DG has been saying right the way through his speech. And Thank you. As Mike said, whether it's pandemic or not, the game is, the rule of the game is the same. Never give up. Thank you very much. Um, John, please. Yes. Yes. Good afternoon. John Zaracostas for France 24 in The Lancet. Um, Director General, you spoke uh, eloquently about solidarity, but can you bring us up to speed how many countries have imposed export controls on personal protective equipment? <clears throat> and if you could give us an update on how many hospitals have infections and how many health personnel are infected. Thank you. On the export control, John, uh, <clears throat> we'll come back to on that. Clearly, a, a large number, or not a large number, but a number of producing countries have uh, imposed uh, restrictions on export of material, uh, protective material, and uh, we're currently uh, tracking that and trying to ensure that essential supplies to WHO obviously are preserved for provision to those third countries that we were describing earlier. Um, <clears throat> we've said consistently since the beginning of this that uh, hoarding, uh, gouging, uh, uh, price manipulation, and the requisition of material uh, that uh, doesn't allow the, that protective equipment to reach those who most need it is something we need to avoid. Uh, we can understand that governments are, have a primary responsibility to their own healthcare workers, but healthcare workers are a global resource. Healthcare workers are a precious resource, and the life of a health worker in one country is certainly as valued as the life of a health worker in another. So we would like to see that word again, solidarity, uh, distribution of whatever the, the commodity is on the basis of need, on the basis of benefit. And when we look at that, our most exposed workers in the world right now to this virus are frontline health workers. And anything that blocks them getting the help they need, getting the assistance and protection they need, is not good. So we do call on countries to re-examine uh, their decisions to requisition uh, and try and ensure that essential supplies of PPE are made available to health workers around the world. So I can touch upon the second part of that question with regards to healthcare worker infections. Um, so health facilities infected as well. Health facilities. And so as you are well aware, we are one of the big concerns that we have for any, any infectious disease, and, and particularly for respiratory pathogens, is the risk of transmission in healthcare facilities. Um, worried about there could potentially be amplifying events or super spreading events. Um, we have not seen that be a hallmark of COVID-19. Um, and so what we are doing in all countries is when we are, when we are, cases are reported to us, um, we do follow up to find out if any of those infected individuals are healthcare workers. You are aware of the healthcare worker infections from China um, that we've heard about. Um, and what is very important for us to understand 
is where and how healthcare workers became infected. Uh, was it through the treatment of patients? Um, was it when they were wearing PPE, uh, putting on PPE, taking off PPE? Was the right PPE used, for example? Um, what we've learned from China is that um, many of the healthcare worker infections, some of them happened early on in the outbreak, um, when you know amongst doctors that hadn't had experience with with COVID-19, experience with in, in infectious diseases, for that matter, um, and that decline in healthcare worker infections over time is really shown um, that, that healthcare workers can be protected. But every healthcare worker infected is one too many. And it's very important, as Mike talked about with the PPE and making sure that we, we prioritize the use of PPE for our frontline workers is really critical. Um, but we are following up in every country um, where there are healthcare worker infections and where there is transmission taking place in a, in a healthcare facility. But um, the transmission in healthcare facilities and, and among healthcare workers has not been a major driver of transmission for this particular pathogen. Um, and I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done to really understand why. Direct in the question, we, we don't have comprehensive numbers on the number of health facilities globally that have had been associated with uh, epidemics. Because obviously, when someone is in a health facility being managed for COVID-19, we don't consider that facility to be affected by COVID, as opposed to a facility that's received a case inadvertently and had an outbreak. So uh, breaking out those numbers is important. Uh, and again, one of our uh, frustrations has been that it has been difficult to get comprehensive data from all countries. Uh, we understand why countries are under pressure, countries are, are struggling with getting the right information. But this week uh, we're redesigning the, the, the data that we require from countries to, to ease the burden on them, but also to clarify exactly what data we need. And we certainly, within the aggregate data, we're going to be asking countries for in real time. Uh, the number of health workers as a proportion of their overall cases will obviously be a major factor in that and uh, and we will track that uh, more comprehensively going forward but as I said it's it's difficult to build a global picture in real time when you're not receiving real-time data from everybody at all times and uh, it's something we're going to have to address now but more importantly into the future thank you very much uh, Jamie and then we will go online one question Jamie thank you hi I'm Jamie um, Dr. Tedros, you mentioned the number of recovered um, in China. What is it elsewhere? What is the number elsewhere? Do you have any figures for that? And you've oftentimes talked about how you want to reduce panic. Telling people the number of people that have recovered is, may, could be, potentially be one way of helping people not panic. So why are you not saying that more often? Mm -hmm. um, Jimmy, I, I think the... the, the um, the difficulty in that is that uh, China and other countries are quite systematic in announcing numbers of patients discharged from hospitals and other systems that's not announced uh, systematically, number one. It's not usually a reported number in all countries, so that's just a technical reason. Uh, secondly, uh, the word uh, you can see in China, the number of recovered has accelerated in the last couple of weeks because that number lags even more than the death number. So, for example, many countries in Europe, people haven't had a chance to recover. Remember, it takes anything up to six weeks to recover from this disease. So uh, it might be uh, quite misleading to say that in a country that has 500 cases, no one has recovered. Uh, is that a good message either? So it can be a hopeful message. It can also be a dis, uh, disheartening message. So I think uh, we need to look carefully at what recovered means uh, in, in this case. But we haven't been systematically gathering the recovered numbers other than when countries tell us they're gathering it, and we do. And that's why we report the recovered number from, from China. But it's a good point in terms of, uh, and I take your point, that as the epidemic goes on, maybe reflecting those numbers more systematically may be very helpful. So we look at that. Can I, can I just follow up? What is your definition of, of being recovered or not recovered? Yeah, Maria will give you the technical definition, but it's usually, uh, I think, uh, two negative PCR results within 24 hours means you're no longer carrying the virus. Recovered is a different uh, issue because that's a very relative term. 
people who've suffered very severe illness can take months to recover from the illness. They, so there's a difference between recovering from the virus infection and your body fully recovering from the impact of what can be a very severe infection. So uh, there is no uh, technical definition for being recovered. At some point in the course of your illness, you will feel recovered or your doctor will tell you you have recovered. Uh, but our definition, I think, is the technical one, right? Yeah, and it, and it varies by when we get the number of recoveries, it depends on what the country is using as their definition of recovered. So it will be the two negative tests 24 hours apart, but it will also be a clinical recovery where they have no more symptoms, respiratory symptoms. And in China, I believe they're also using a clear CT scan. Um, but I would like to give you that number from China because it's more than 58,600 people who have recovered in China. And the DG has said that's more than 70% of the cases reported to date. That is a very positive number, and I agree, we all agree those numbers should be reported, but it does take some time for people to get to that point. Um, you know, 80% of the people who are infected with this will recover, and that is an, also an important message. Um, but those that are, that do develop severe disease, we need to make sure that they're cared for, you know, very carefully and make sure that, that they're chances of recovery are as high as possible all over the world. Thank you very much. We will go now online. We will start uh, with the uh, NPR. Can you, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, this is Ping Huang from NPR. And along those lines, I want, I want to ask um, if you could elaborate a little bit on what the term mild to moderate means because I've heard that it includes pneumonia, but I think that when people hear that 80% of people get mild to moderate disease, it seems like no big deal. Uh, so, so that is a very good point. So we do say that 80% of people, well, based on our information from China, we should, we stick, let's stick with our facts here. 80% of the cases reported from China have had a mild or moderate infection, mild or moderate disease. Um, the moderate part of that disease, part of that definition does include pneumonia, a, a quote-unquote mild version of pneumonia. So there are people that are developing disease, so we don't want to undermine that. Um, but it is important to know that this mild infection starts normally with a fever, although it may take a couple days to get a fever. You will have some respiratory symptoms. You'll have some aches and pains. You'll have a dry cough. This is what the majority of individuals will have. Some of those individuals will go on to develop a mild form of pneumonia. Some of them will go on to, to, to develop a more severe um, version of pneumonia will require oxygen, some will require ventilation, um, some will require um, ECMO, um, and unfortunately some people will die. But in the mild, moderate category, um, it does include a, a mild form of pneumonia for some individuals. Thank you very much. I will read the, the, the question from Bloomberg because we owe them that from Friday. Uh, Corinne Gretler is asking, and I think this is also for Maria, uh, what have you learned about the death rates for the elderly versus other age groups? Can you give any details on the mortality rate for people above 60 or 70 versus people in their 30s and 40s? So yes, I can. Um, so we, we've talked a lot about mortality up here, and, and we've talked about the difficulties in, 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 in calculating mortality. But we do know that there are some um, underlying conditions, some uh, medical conditions that will put people at a higher risk for death. Uh, and those include um, cardiovascular disease. They include chronic respiratory disease. They include cancer. And they include diabetes. Um, I can give you a breakdown of what that is in China. But of course, this, this uh, depends on the information that we receive. There are a lot of uh, peer-reviewed publications that are coming out right now um, that do have details of the risk of death based on underlying conditions from a subset of patients. So this is information we're trying to gather to get a more comprehensive picture. Um, what I can tell you from China, um, and this is not data as of today, but data uh, um, from, from earlier, um, that mortality among people who are over 80 is highest um, amongst the age group, and the, and the mortality is above 20%. Um, there, are, uh, there is higher mortality for people who have underlying conditions. For example, for those with cardiovascular disease, around 13%. Um, for those who have diabetes, around 9%. For those with chronic respiratory disease, around 8%, and for those with cancer, around 7.5%. Now, these numbers um, you know, are based on a subset of the total cases that have been reported to date. Um, and it is important that um, not only, I mean, we talk about this quite a lot, and, and what 
our goals are is to reduce transmission, is to reduce the number of people infected, not only among younger people and healthier people, but among people who have these risk factors. So we can prevent infection in people who have these risk factors. Um, so we hope that we will, we will receive more information um, about underlying conditions and the risk of death from a number of other countries, but that is some information that we need to see it, it, the consistency across countries. I think those data you presented, Maria, are publicly available They're data. All, yes, so this is not report. a surprise to countries. Yep. And countries making their pandemic plans are well aware of the numbers and estimates in China for many weeks now. Yes. Uh, and I think it's very important when we make the sometimes uh, brutal calculations of herd immunity and delaying of spread and achieving herd immunity and how maybe we should let the wave pass over us and, and then more people will be immune and this will all go away. That there are many vulnerable people in our communities for which this still will not go away. Uh, and uh, uh, turning to face that fire is very important. Uh, our elderly, uh, our people with underlying conditions, people uh, with cancer on chemotherapy and others are our precious members of our society. And uh, the arithmetic of epidemiology as I said, for me, we, in epidemiology, we talk about the N, the size of the population we're dealing with. Uh, we often say the N is the population of the country or the population of the world. So is N 7.8 billion? But for me, as a medical professional, N equals one. Every person matters. Every single person matters. And every community matters. Uh, and every society matters. Every country matters. So I think we have to balance what are the epidemiologic calculations with what are the really in, uh, tragic uh, and, and, and difficult scenes of, of family members worrying about their, particularly their elderly relatives or spouses worrying about their, their partners who have uh, cancer or are on chemotherapy. This is a very personal story and it's very easy to wrap it up in numbers and graphs and trends. Uh, but in the end, there are many, many people around the world who are concerned. Uh, and they're particularly concerned about those in their families and communities who are very vulnerable. And it is the duty of us all, governments, communities alike, to do as much as we can to protect those communities, and particularly to protect those vulnerable people amongst us. N equals one. The numbers I quoted were in the China Mission Report, just for those of you that want to check. Sorry, Thank you. No, I think... Uh, this particular issue, especially uh, about our uh, senior, our senior citizens or the elderly, is very, very important. Uh, if anything is going to hurt the world, it's a moral decay. And not taking the death of the elderly or the sit the senior citizens as a serious issue is one of the moral decays, and Mike had said it. Any individual, whatever age, any human being matters. And it pains us to see, actually, in some places when they want to move into mitigation because the virus kills seniors or older people only. That's dangerous. Whether it kills a young person or on an old person or a senior citizen, any country has an obligation to save that person. So that's why we are saying no white flag. We don't give up. We fight to protect our children to protect our senior citizens. At the end of the day, it's a human life. We cannot, I have said this many times, by the way, we cannot say we care about millions when we don't care about an individual person who may be senior or junior, who may be young or old. So that's what WHO is saying. And for all countries, a comprehensive approach a blended approach, an approach that can help contain this outbreak is very important because the death rate from this outbreak is high. We shouldn't 
categorize it by young or senior. Of course, to understand the epidemiology, it's fine to do that. But for action, I think ev every life matters. Every individual life matters. If we don't care about one individual, whether it's old or young, then we're not serious. And that's why we're saying this is a moral decay if we try to categorize it that way. A moral decay of the society. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a question uh, from uh, Corinne Gretler from Bloomberg. Uh, and I hope, uh, Corinne, you got uh, the answer. If Chris is OK, we can move to our next question from online. Uh, new scientist, Adam. Yeah, yeah. hi. Yeah. It's Adam Vaughan here from New Scientist. Um, you said you welcomed the, the aggressive measures on travel in, in Italy. I was interested in whether you think they they will work to limit the spread of the vir virus and relieve the burden on how healthcare systems. Um, I think uh, two things. I mean, obviously, within the zone. They're not going to help. The, the, there's, two, there's two challenges here that Italy faces. One is dealing with the crisis within the zone in which disease is transmitting at community level. And clearly you've seen that the system there is under some pressure in terms of the healthcare provision uh, system and others. So the, those, uh, Lombardy and others, have got to face uh, the difficulty now of dealing with quite an active epidemic in their zone. So restriction of movement in and out of those zones doesn't necessarily help. This is very much similar to the, the China experience. But reducing the flow of, of potential infections into other areas may offer those zones the opportunity to prepare and potentially have a different outcome. And that's what we saw in, in China. We saw the provinces getting an, an earlier warning. They were able to prepare. The number of likely infected people going to other provinces was reduced. It wasn't entirely blocked. It didn't stop it. But it, what it meant was the other provinces never reached the scale of transmission. Can you imagine in, in China and in Wuhan, if every other province had become a Wuhan, China may not have coped. The reason China could cope was they only had one Wuhan. And they managed to keep each and every other province at a, not a minimum level, but at a manageable level. So the question for Italy is, can they launch a large-scale epidemic response in the most affected areas? And they, can they limit the emergence of the epidemic in the other areas so they can focus on their intervention in, in, in the most affected zones? So this is a tactical move. It's not going to stop disease necessarily moving out uh, of those zones. It will delay and reduce that spread and hopefully allow authorities to focus their efforts in the most affected zones. That, to me, represents a reasonable tactical approach. It's not a guarantee, and certainly quarantine measures at a population level are never a guarantee of shutting down transmission uh, out of a zone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan. We'll go to the next question. It's uh, John Cohen from uh, Science. John, can you hear us? Hello, do we have a John Cohen online? If not, uh, we will then see if there is any questions here in the room. Uh, yeah, please. Can you please press the, yes. I'm Bad Yashin from Iran International. It's regarding the health work. Uh, you said that you don't have a comprehensive uh, data regarding the death of, uh, among them. But uh, in Iran, so far, the official report says that you know, uh, there are more than uh, 10 health workers who lost uh, combating COVID-19 lost their lives. Uh, the question, as I said, might uh, seem a bit redundant, but is there any action plan to support health workers as you admire them who uh, battled the COVID-19 at the forefront? And uh, especially in countries that, you know, equipment like uh, PPE is uh, not very available, like in Iran, and do you support them morally? How do you do that? Yeah, I, 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 Maria, Maria can add. There are two circumstances in which health workers are exposed to COVID-19. One is a, an unsuspecting health worker in a, in a facility where, if we imagine over the last few weeks, in an unaffected country who's treating patients normally and then inadvertently treats someone who has COVID. It's very hard to protect that worker. Uh, so training workers to have a high index of suspicion 
for a suspected case so that they don't expose themselves. And we've seen a number of nosocomial events or hospital transmissions in China and outside where that has happened. The disease has entered a healthcare facility and spread amongst patients or amongst healthcare workers who aren't in protective gear. They're just working in their normal uh, situation. That's one way we need, we need to avoid those epidemics. The second way in which a health worker is potentially exposed is if they are working in a COVID-19 ward and they don't have appropriate protective gear or they don't have the training to use that gear uh, effectively or that they're working such long shifts, long hours and under such stress that they're not able to maintain their performance or maintain their behaviour to protect themselves. And I think this is something that people need to consider. It's not just the equipment. I've spent many hours and days and weeks in protective equipment. It is very difficult to wear. It is hot, it is restrictive, it, is, it cuts you off from the world, your goggles fog up, your hands just become totally unmanageable. It's very difficult. And you've seen those workers in China having to do eight-hour shifts without even being able to go to the toilet because they couldn't, you know, they had to work eight-hour shifts uh, straight through. So I think in those circumstances, we owe, lot, we owe a lot to those workers. The very minimum we can give those frontline workers is the PPE and the training. Um, and the management arrangements so we can manage their stress and their fatigue. Um, and I think most countries are moving to do that, and that's why we spoke earlier about this issue of requisitioning of PPE. Um, the real tragedy, I think, uh, in the coming days and weeks will be the moral hazard and the dilemma that health workers may face if they've got COVID-19 patients in front of them who need help and they don't have the protective equipment to protect themselves. Would you like to be that health worker? Would you like to be a doctor or a nurse having to treat a patient knowing full well that you are not protected? That's an awful dilemma that no health worker, no health worker in the world should have to face. And it's a massive responsibility of government uh, at, 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 at national level and at international level to have the solidarity to fix that. But having the equipment doesn't solve the problem. You also need training. And training is just as important as PPE. And Maria might want to comment on that. We have a lot of training material online, and there's a lot of uh, support for countries to do training. We do. We have a detailed package of um, trainings and guidance that are online for healthcare workers um, in different types of settings, whether these are in clinics or whether these are through ICU. Um, and I think that 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 and reaching the right level, reaching the healthcare workers, making sure that that information gets to them in the appropriate way is really critical. Um, so everything we have is online. Um, we provide they they participate with us on teleconferences and, and whatnot. The only other thing to add from what Mike said is the support that we give health healthcare workers at home. Um, you know, these are people. These are mothers. These are fathers. These are daughters. These are sons, and they have kids and they have parents and. Um, unfortunately, what we've seen in many healthcare workers is that they weren't infected in the healthcare setting, they were infected at home or outside of the healthcare setting. And so what, I, what we've seen in some countries is that other members of the community have been helping healthcare workers um, with the rest of their lives. Um, they've helped them do grocery shopping. They've helped them clean their homes. You know, they've helped them look after their kids. And that's, you know, beyond the technical of what, what WHO can provide, there's, an, there's a humanity element, there's a solidarity element here that our frontline workers are putting themselves at risk. They always do. Uh, and we are eternally grateful to them for that. But we can also help them at home. And so maybe not from, you know, a WHO technical guidance here, but this is something that we can all do in, in, in helping them out. Thank you very much. Let's take a few more questions from journalists online. Uh, do we have uh, Jim Westwood? Uh, hi, it's uh, Jim. Hi, it's Jim. News. hi, thank you very much. Hi. First of all, uh, you have to know how much we appreciate how frustrating it must be for you to be in demand for answers about a virus you're learning about in real time. So please know that we really appreciate this. Uh, my, my question is really, is, is there a light at the end of the tunnel here at all? Do we see an end to this thing even now? We, we know that the fundamental measures that are put in place seem to work in controlling the spread, but do we see a light at the end of the tunnel? Thank you, Jim, for this. Um, Maria may want to, to give a more technical answer than me, but right now uh, I think we're still very much in the beginning or middle 
uh, at the very maximum of this of this fight. The disease has not run its course by any means in most countries. In fact, most of the countries affected of the 100 have recently imported the disease. Uh, the spread of the virus now and its impact are more in the hands of us and society than they, they are due to the virus itself. There's a lot, and Maria has spoken to this, the DJ has spoken to this, there's a lot we can do to slow it down. There's a lot we can do to turn this virus around. Uh, but uh, And there are things that may happen with, with uh, temperature change, not that the virus will change uh, because of the temperature, but certainly human behavior changes according to seasons and uh, the way in which humans mix and distance socially changes with seasons. So we may see some natural uh, changes in the, in the incidence of the disease. But uh, as I've said uh, many times in the past, uh, hope is not a strategy. Uh, and therefore, when we look at this as being realistic, we're still very much uh, in the up uh, cycle of this uh, of this uh, epidemic, uh, and there are still uh, a number of miles to go. The hope, uh, and to be quite frank, uh, the way in which China, uh, Singapore, Korea, and Japan uh, are at various points of turning a corner, gives me great hope. And in that sense, and as the Director General has spoken about, uh, the very fact that there's an element of controllability. There's an element that this can be turned around, and we need to seize that opportunity. In that sense, uh, the D Director General has been talking about the window of opportunity closing and the spectre of a pandemic rising. Well, at the same time, another window of opportunity may be uh, opening, and that is the data and the experience in some uh, Asian countries, where there's clearly an indication that the application of measures across all of society, a systematic government-led approach using all tactics and all elements available seems to be able to turn this disease around. Uh, Maria, you may have a more precise definition of where you think we are epidemiologically. Uh, one thing we, we never want to do is predict you know, what, w what will actually happen. It, it is in our hands. It is in the hands of how every, every country d deals with this. Um, I mean, I think... Um, in, in many countries, it will get worse before it gets better. Um, but in, in many others, you know, there are, they only have one or two cases or they haven't had cases yet. And that is an opportunity to, to, to stop something before it begins. We, we've talked a lot about the C's, the four C's, the no cases, cases, clusters, community, transmission, when we think about transmission. And it's <laughs> difficult to answer that question on a global scale. Um, but to break it down country by country, I think that's really really important and especially important for each country to do on its own. What is my risk? What is the risk of, of importation in my country? What is the risk of transmission in my country? What is our capacity to deal with this? Where are we? Where do we have gaps? Um, and how do we address those gaps? Those are really critical questions for every country to be to be asking themselves if they haven't already. Um, and if we look at a country like China that's had more than 80,000 cases, even within China, you break it down where you have Wuhan, you have what happened in Wuhan, you had what happened in Hubei, you have what happened in all of the other provinces. And they have showed us that they've slowed, slowed this down tremendously and in some countries have stopped, in some provinces have stopped transmission. Um, and we really can't forget that. Um, we've seen Singapore take drastic action and, and reduce their transmission. Um, we've seen some countries not have any onward transmission. Um, so in terms of what may happen and the light at the end of the tunnel, absolutely, we can see a light at the end of the tunnel. Absolutely. But it will, that how quickly we get there depends on what countries do. The DG has been very consistent in his messaging. We've been very consistent in what we've, say, what we've been saying, that the aggressive measures will depend on what happens will depend, will dictate what happens in, in each country. Um, but if we can see a country have more than 80,000 cases, now start to see a decline, um, that is more than hope. That is, that is evidence you know, of showing that this can be done. And it's, not, it's the fundamental health, public health measures that have been used by, uh, across China and in many other countries that have shown that that transmission can be reduced. So it's, it's a difficult question to answer. There isn't one global answer to that, but in each individual countries, we should be asking that question. Please. Yeah. Um, you know, we can, we can see the extent of the problem when um, we try to see what the situation looks like 
by a group of countries, for instance. Um, out of the more than 100 countries now, how many? 110 countries who have reported. 43 countries have less than 10 cases. So we're saying, especially those countries, 43 countries with this land, less than 10 cases, moving into cutting this from the bud and containing and blocking transmission or second transmission, secondary transmission is possible. Then if you take the additional 36 countries have 11 to 100 cases, the same. This could be they're in a better position again to follow the same strategy. So take those countries with less than 100 cases. These are 79 countries out of 110. That's why we're saying let's, let's not make a mistake by taking the 100 more than 100,000 cases in more than 100 countries just as a lump sum without showing or without seeing into what it looks like when you categorize it by country. So mind you, 79 countries less than 100 cases each. And a good number of them, 43, actually less than 10 cases. That's why each and every country has to assess its situation and do, you know, aggressive containment strategy to cut it from, from the bud. Then take the countries we have, six countries more than 1,000. This is including, um, you know, uh, China. And even then, when you have thousands of cases, we have seen from China and Korea that you can actually make a dent mm -hmm. and you can reverse the tide. Mm -hmm. So this is what we are saying. Less than 100 cases, 79 countries probably better suited to have a successful containment strategy and ultimately stop the transmission. But even those with higher number of cases, more, one, more than 1,000, let's say six countries, uh, still there is a possibility because countries are showing that. So we're being pragmatic. We're being realistic in proposing as WHO that whether we call it pandemic or not, we're really close now with a quality, qualitative change of spreading into 100 countries but still, the comprehensive approach or the blended approach of using the containment strategy and other strategies, containment and mitigation all in one, is very important. So the message here is, even if we call it a pandemic, still we can contain it and control it. That's what we are saying. It could be a matter of time. But if we give it our best, it could be the first pandemic. I, 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 I said it uh, earlier that we can, we can make sure that we don't live with it. <laughs> so pandemic doesn't mean that we, we say, OK, it's fine to live with it. We're saying it could be a pandemic, but we shouldn't accept to live with it. We can contain it. But there is pandemic-like flu that we have agreed for several years now to live with it, even when we have vaccines and so on. But on this one, it's very fatal, by the way, even if it affects the elderly. And we shouldn't choose to live with it. That's our message. And we should give it our best. And we can win this battle. That's what we are saying from WHO. Thank you very much. We have a time for one last question because we promised it to, to John Cohen from Science. Uh, John, can you hear us this time? Yes, I hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, 
Yes, please, please go ahead. This is the last yeah, question. I want to ask, thank you so much. I want to ask a pragmatic, practical question about the elderly. Given that the uh, mission report found 21.9% mortality in, in the uh, over 80 group, my mother is 90. And I have a personal question that I think applies to a lot of people around the world. Should she stop meeting with her friends now? She lives in California. And there's virus spreading there. And I think she should stop her card games and her Mahjong games and start the social distancing earlier. And I wonder why WHO and CDC in my country don't explicitly tell this to the over 80 population to start the social distancing early. What do you think? Thank you, John, for that question. Thanks, John. Always the, the easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, no, it, 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 your 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 point is 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 very well made. Uh, we uh, we issue risk management advice to countries, and you know we obviously want to leave it to countries to make specific recommendations to specific risk groups or specific age groups depending on the risk profiles in those. Uh, an 80-year-old in one country is very often not the same as an 80-year-old in another country. And, uh, and depending on, on those uh, population, dyna population dynamics, that can be different advice in different places. But uh, given the fact that uh, our elderly are very vulnerable, I would definitely say that in terms of, for example, um, visiting uh, long-term care facilities and nursing homes, that nursing homes should be making a re immediate arrangements to reduce the risk of introducing, introducing disease into those settings. Um, I think certainly uh, more elderly uh, members of our community, particularly those with underlying conditions, should be. And I think uh, already that advice is, is pretty much out there. I mean, people have been the advice has been to all people, and particularly to vulnerable people, to limit their contacts uh, in crowded situations to be exacting in their hand and other hygiene. Uh, but you are correct. Maybe we do need to, to push forward and be more precise in our advice to that group in terms of uh, attending gatherings, uh, for example, travel and, and, and other things. And we, 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 will, we, will, uh, we will definitely uh, take a strong <clears throat> look at that uh, in, the coming, in the coming days. Um, and again, we don't want to, as the DJ has just said, uh, there is this uh, perception that uh, mitigation in, as a measure is just about waiting for a long-term vaccine and trying to reduce mortality while that happens and that mortality will happen in elderly people. Uh, the DG has made it clear what his views are on that. We have to move towards a strategy of control. It's, it's, it's not about mitigating the worst impact. In, in, a, in a flu pandemic, you are mitigating in the sense you don't have an element of controllability. You can't stop the virus in any meaningful way. So you focus on reducing the impact of the virus. A control strategy says you have an element of control. And what you do is both seek to control the virus and reduce its impact at the same time. And I think we've had this uh, unfortunate <clears throat> emergence of camps around the containment camp, the mitigation camp, and different groups presenting and championing their view of the world. And uh, frankly speaking, it's not helpful. I think we need to now look at the last eight to 10 weeks. We need to look at what we've learned about this virus, both negatively in terms of its concerns and positively around what can be done about the virus. And we need to put our heads together and evolve our strategy, not to live on strategies of the past and the past maybe years ago, but the past right now with this virus is eight weeks ago. What have we learned? Has our strategy evolved? The DG has said a blended strategy that takes the learning of the previous eight to 10 weeks and puts that into an, a, an evolved approach that allows every country to design a strategy for controlling this virus that's best adapted to their circumstance and to the global needs. And I think within that, going back to your question, John, we have to be within that very precise and maybe increasingly precise in our advice to high-risk groups. Yeah, no, so much. By the way, in my uh, statement today, when I outlined the fundamental uh, elements of the response, uh, I said all of them, actually, the fundamental principles apply to all countries. And I have tried to outline them. And one of them is what you just said, 
I started with emergency response mechanisms, uh, risk communications and public engagement, case finding and contact tracing, then public health measures such as hand hygiene and social distancing. But the social distancing is not just for the elderly only. It's for the others too. So where we should apply, especially in countries where we have community transmission, then it has to apply to, to, to all. So it will not be just for the elderly uh, only. So we need to have tailored interventions based on the four uh, categories which I have already announced in my statement. Thank you very much. We will conclude with this for today. And I apologize to journalists online who were who were not able to ask questions, such as Helen Branswell. Uh, then we have uh, Zahra from BuzzFeed. Uh, we have Banjo from Down to Earth, uh, Andy Kopsa, and others. Uh, we will have another opportunity on Wednesday. So please uh, uh, stay with us. Uh, we are sending regularly news from our offices in other countries uh, when we send audio files. So uh, have a look uh, for that. Thanks, everyone, and have a nice evening.